Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com and subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. Uh, the subscription links are in the show notes for each and every episode, so just head on over to quicksurf.com and uh, find the latest episode there on the homepage and uh, go ahead and subscribe. For those of you who have already subscribed, thank you so much for subscribing and supporting the show. And with that, let's go ahead and get into some of the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Uh, starting off over at cnet.com, uh, Facebook is buying Oculus Rift. Uh, this is really huge. The virtual reality company, Oculus, which will soon be worth uh, $2 billion, had its humble beginnings as a Kickstarter campaign. And um, the question that the CNET.com article asks is, what will become of the project backers and will this deal change the crowdfunding platform? I think those are both very interesting questions to ask. The biggest uh, thing, obviously, is that Facebook is buying 18-month-old Oculus for $2 billion. They just announced it today, Tuesday, March 25th. So uh, pretty big news. Definitely um, something to be uh, to, uh, to see what, what's going to come of it. I, I'm curious what they're planning to do with it. Uh, should be pretty neat. But the larger question is, what does this really mean? Um, and that's really kind of what I'm curious to see what's going to happen. I'd li like to hear from uh, some of the audience. Go ahead and shoot me an email, geekinator at quicksurf.com. What do you think is going to happen with Oculus, or what does this $2 billion Facebook Oculus merge really mean in the long run? From uh, ocregister.com, feds are launching a cyber safety campaign for children as a parent. I'm not going to say how many children, uh, just to maintain some privacy here, but as a parent of children, um, this I find to be exceedingly important. Um, do you know what your children are doing online? The question is asked at the beginning of the article. I do. All my internet traffic runs through a proxy server. If they're on my network, I know what they're doing. The father of an Orange County teenage girl thought he did. He said he was shocked when he discovered last year that his sweet little girl was exchanging sexually explicit videos, photos, and text messages with strange men on Facebook and apps like Snapchat. I realize this is a little family friendly, but this is an exceedingly important uh, topic and technology can be brought to bear to make things safer. The register is not naming the father to avoid identifying his then 16-year-old daughter, who was a victim of a of a of a predator. Um, when he and the girl's stepmother discovered the images on her smartphone, they immediately called authorities, and a 27-year-old man was arrested to help curb the escalating number of children falling prey to predators online. Uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Homeland Security Investigations Division launched a first-of-its-kind national cyber safety campaign Tuesday in partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The campaign was announced during a news conference at Newhart Middle School in Mission Viejo. Uh, every week, the National Center receives 1,500 reports of dissemination of child pornography and other forms of online exploitation of children, said Michelle Collins, the center's vice president. So every year they receive more and more of these reports. They are starting a campaign to try to cut down on what's, uh, you know, going on with this sort of thing. I applaud the effort. Like I said, as a parent myself, you know, uh, I try not to be one of those helicopter parents, but at the same time, you can never be too careful, particularly when your children are online. So, um, you know, got to make it safe. Got to make it safe. And please train your children about safe practices on the internet. That is the single most important thing you can do is an educated child is much less likely to fall prey to that sort of thing. From Bloomberg Business Week, Google to de-dorkify glass in partnership with Ray-Ban maker Luxottica. Ooh, nice. 
Uh, about a week ago, Google seemed to face a tense moment in the development of its high-profile glass wearable computer. Call it a peak glass cynicism, if you will, cynicism. Some of the device's earliest fans were questioning Google's devotion to the product. Bars were banning it, citing the device's surreptitious integrated camera. I've certainly had concerns about this. You know, I've actually worn a pair of Google Glass from a friend who 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 got a pair. He's part of their Explorer program, and uh, I see the potential. But at the same time, this I also see the giant, giant can of worms that this opens. So uh, Google is attempting to kind of you know uh, make the image of Google Glass a little less. Meh, and more, whoa, hey, if you will. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how successful they are with that. Uh, for those of you who are kind of old school, I thought this ne next article is really awesome. Uh, Microsoft is releasing the MS-DOS source code. This is from techtimes.com. Hackers rejoice. Microsoft has just released the source code for three, three, of its most famous operating systems. Unfortunately for cyber thieves, the operating systems are MS-DOS 1.1, 2.0, and Windows 1.1a. In a nod to the historical significance of the code, the company gave it to the Computer History Museum. We think preserving historic source code like these two programs is key to understanding how software has evolved from primitive roots to become a crucial part of our civilization. Pretty interesting. Uh, interested geeks will be amazed to see that MS-DOS was a fully functioning OS that was only 12 kilobytes in size. Can you believe that? 12K. Talk about taking this and studying it to learn what you can do with an operating system in that small size. 12 kilobyte compared to Windows 8.1, which requires a 20 gigabyte hard drive. That's right. For uh, the 64-bit versions. So back then, 12K was a lot of memory. Nowadays, 12K, not so much. In embedded world, 12K is a lot of memory. Believe me, when you have uh, one of these little bad boys here, 12K of memory is a lot of memory. Uh, I do a bunch of embedded development at my job, and one of the products that we have is 48K of RAM. That's it. That's all you got is 48K of RAM. You got to do everything inside of 48K of RAM. So... Pretty interesting. Anyway, uh, I thought I'd share that for those of us out there who want to potentially, you know, look at the source code and, and see what how Microsoft did things back in the day. Obviously, it has no bearing on, you know, how things are done today uh, <laughs> in Microsoft land, but still, you know, pretty cool. From EE Times, Audi's self-driving car rides NVIDIA. Uh, Audi's self-driving car drove a few feet onto the stage of the McEnry Convention Center in San Jose powered in part by an NVIDIA Tegra K1 processor. The short trip marked NVIDIA's shift in mobile focus to automotive, though the Audi car itself will also use three other processors when it is complete. So pretty interesting. Um, go ahead and uh, look the story up and read it. I, I thought it was interesting and I would share it with everybody out there. From... Uh, TechRadar.com, Intel shows it's serious about wearables. It picks up a health tracker maker. For those of you who uh, have been following me for a while, you'll, you'll uh, discover that I've recently picked up a Fitbit. Um, I'm not wearing it right now because it's charging. But, uh, I, you know, I've, I've recently uh, become kind of interested in, like, just general measuring some basic statistics to see where I can potentially make some improvements in, in terms of, you know, how active I am on average. And, and it's not that I'm overweight because I'm not. If anything, I'm actually underweight for my frame size. But, uh, you know, just to kind of get a gauge for, you know, where about where I am and then maybe, you know, tweak a few things here and there. I'm also doing this... Uh, you know, with somebody else who, who wants to lose some weight. So it's kind of a, to support that person as well as, as uh, you know, just kind of see where I'm at myself. So anyway, pretty neat. Uh, Intel has purchased uh, Basis Science, the makers of the Basis Band Health and Fitness Tracker. I've actually never heard of them before. Otherwise, I would have evaluated them. Um, the acquisition reportedly somewhere in the range of $100 million gives Intel immediate traction in the market as it seeks to create a host of smart wearables. Uh, this, I think, is where the future is going to be 
you know, it would be nice if we could have an iWatch a la iWatch if, if Apple makes one or maybe, you know, Fitbit. They did have the Fitbit Force. It, it was recalled, but it basically, you know, uh, uh, acted as a watch along with being a health tracker. You know, I'm a huge fan of, of wearing a watch that does much more than a watch, but it looks like a watch and behaves like a watch. You know, there's no reason why you can't have a watch that you can actually use and it looks and acts like a watch, but it's maybe got some added functionality for biometrics and that sort of thing. There's no reason why you can't do that. So anyway, uh, you know, wearables is kind of where things are heading from what I can see. Um, you know, Google is a little bit ahead of the curve with Google Glass. I totally see something where there's something you can wear on your wrist or, you know, a, a necklace or something of that nature um, that can be worn as jewelry and also it's, it's, you know, monitors, you know, how many steps you take in a day and that sort of thing. So anyway, pretty interesting. Definitely check the story out. You know, I, like I said, I think wearables is kind of where it's going to go. You know, the phone, you know, as nice as it is, the, the mobile phone has kind of reached a form factor where, you know, Apple has, has largely gotten the phone to a point where there's nothing else they can really remove from it as far as a form factor goes. And all they can do is add functionality without cluttering up this form factor. You know, as far as physical hardware goes, you know, this is kind of the, you can't get much more basic and simple than this. So, um, you know, there's not a lot more innovation they can do except for software and adding sensors and that sort of thing. And I think the sensors would be better served if you were wearing the sensor instead of something you have in your pocket. You know, the thing I like about the Fitbit is, is that uh, it's, I can wear it in the shower. I, I can wear it to bed. I can't take my phone in the shower, you know. I can take my phone to bed and put it under my pillow, but that's less than ideal. You know, this is just a bracelet, just like, you know, any other bracelet that I would have on. And um, I can wear it. That's the important thing is I can wear it pretty much everywhere. It's water resistant. I don't have to worry about it getting wet. And it gives me basic biometrics. So pretty neat. From time.com with remote play, NVIDIA's, NVIDIA Shield's killer PC game streaming hits the road. PC gamers will soon be able to play from anywhere if the connection is fast enough. Uh, starting next week, NVIDIA Shield owners won't have to be at home to tap into the PC gaming collections. Uh, an update for N NVIDIA's gaming handheld scheduled for April 2nd will add remote game streaming as a beta feature. So if you have a good enough NVIDIA graphics card and upload download speeds of at least 5 megabits per second, which is kind of a healthy internet connection, um, you can stream your PC's entire game library to Shield over the internet. So that's, that's pretty cool. I can totally see something like that. Uh, definitely check it out if you're a gamer. Google, according to the Wall Street Journal and their personal tech news blog, is selling the HTC One, otherwise known as the M8, with stock Android. This is nice. Some reviewers are calling the HTC One the best all-around Android phone money can buy, but if you're looking at picking up one off contract, you may want to consider buying the One directly from Google rather than through a carrier. On Tuesday, as HTC introduced the phone, the One popped up in Google Play at an unsubsidized price of $699. Yikes. Which is about the same price you'd pay if you bought the phone outright from AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, or Verizon. The difference is the phone is unlocked and you can pretty much do whatever you want. So that will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And for those, for those of you who have, thank you so much. And I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.